hi again, uh, the students in Poland. We didn't get a chance to finish all of your questions this morning. Really enjoyed our conversation. And I want to just, a couple last questions we didn't get to. And I definitely want to talk about them. You guys raised some really good questions. The last part, Kate, of your question. Uh, did my experience being the only American left in Rwanda in a time of need change my opinion of, of uh, America? And did this experience make me become more open-minded? In many ways, yeah. My opinion of America, I would say probably before the genocide, was kind of romanticized, you know, come to the rescue and really stand up for liberty and justice. Everybody's equal. Everybody matters. Not very realistic uh, if you look at our history. We have some times of great that we can be proud of and other times that no, other people were not treated equally and were not valued. I think probably the way it has opened my mind is I have, I have stopped defining America by this. I mean, we have a good constitution and uh, at least a little bit I know, I'm kind of getting out of my range here, um, but an amazing constitution and the country's values in terms of when you look at democracy and, and the framework, really good framework, but it all comes down to people. And, and are people's, are people willing to put others, other interest ahead of their own? Are we going to be egocentric as an individual or even as a country? Are we willing to look at how important it is for us to build inclusion among ourselves and among the other countries? One of the things that comes um, pretty clear to me about this is something I've been reading about and exploring lately. It's kind of asked the question, who's in the center of the universe? Who's in the center of this equation or of this situation? And if I'm only thinking about my own personal needs, we're not going to have a good outcome. Or if a country is only thinking about its own individual benefit and not how it plays in to cooperation as a global citizen, we're going to have um, terrible outcomes. And I think one of the problems was um, during the Rwandan genocide is that the American government saw no interest in Rwanda, no political interest, no economic interest, no place to, you know, maybe have a military base or something. They didn't see the human interest. And definitely my mind has opened more widely as I look and recognize um, it's important to have very uh, sound frameworks, checks and balances, but it really does come down to the people who are operating within this framework, using this framework. And are they simply seeing themselves as the center and everything is about them? Or do we see ourselves more on a global level and that we can either bring more people into the center or at certain times, like at the time of the Rwandan genocide, the people of Rwanda deserve to be the center of the universe. And we figure out how, as a global community, we can come in and help them, just similar to today, the, the people suffering in Syria or the people suffering in Burma. We put them in the center. And as a group, a, a, a global community, we circle around and we figure out how can we support that part of our family. That's a little bit of thoughts about America, and I appreciated your question there. Florence, you have some really good questions here, uh, A, B, and C, in fact. Do, do I think that the Interahamwe government, the extremist government, was completely to blame for the genocide? Uh, before I go to the next part, let me just show you an image. This is from the Kigali Genocide Memorial, and it's a, it's a photograph of the relatively small group of men and women who planned the genocide. This is a group of politicians, businessmen and women who are manipulating the needs of ordinary people. I think it's, it's really important to look at genocide uh, for exactly what a unique, horrible idea, problem-solving strategy that it is. When, when you are planning to kill 
families, grandma and grandpa, the kids, everybody, and we're wiping them out because of their ethnicity or their religious orientation. For you know, they are some group that we think is the problem. Blame always leads us to that kind of, well, often leads us to that kind of thinking. So, so the idea of genocide, um, really, I do lay at the feet of the of the men and women who said that's going to be the solution. Um, and and there are other factors that led to it, but I think we'd be really wrong to try to. Um, promote the factors, the historical factors, or perhaps some economic factors that, that played into this, to put them on the same level as the planners of the genocide, um, no, you know, the, the, the real responsibility does lie with this group of men and women from, from my perspective. The other part of your question here, um, is about the Rwandan Patriotic Front. Did they play a significant role in continuing the civil war and the genocide? And then you say, or failing to stop it. Now, I think it's really important too that we differentiate. In 1990, the Rwandan Patriotic Front did attack Rwanda from Uganda, but who are they? The Rwandan Patriotic Front were Rwandans who had fled for their lives or children of Rwandans who had fled for their lives, mostly of the Tutsi ethnicity. In, in 19, the late 50s, early 1962 at the time of independence. Afterwards, I'm sure they thought, hey, things settle down, we can come home. Many of their family were killed in 59, 60, 61, 60, at that time of independence. Many were killed. So you understand why they fled for their lives. Then they should have been allowed home. 10 years, 20 years, no, 30. Finally, they said we're coming home by force. So that's the war that will go from 90 to 93. Um, and I won't get into more of that uh, with the, right now. But your question is, you know, did they play a significant role in continuing the civil war? They wanted to come home. They didn't want that war to last any longer than it had to, so they could bring their families home. Home. So no, I wouldn't see any continuation of the war, the RPF wanting to string that out for anything. There have been some academics who have put forth these uh, theories that somehow the RPF didn't want to end the genocide until uh, a bunch of people had been killed and then they would have an easier time dominating and taking over everything. I don't, I don't buy that for a couple of reasons. One, um, they were not in a position to stop the genocide like the UN was in a position to stop the genocide. They were very poorly equipped. I mean, they, they were doing amazing with what they had, but they didn't have funding and, and or, or adequate. They, they had piecemeal funding where they could get from this person or that, that group or that group. They were very a small group fighting an existing government's military infrastructure that had been around for years, many, many, many times larger than the Rwandan Patriotic Front. So the idea, um, logistically, no, they didn't have the chance to just stop it quickly. In fact, the fact that they stopped it in three months is a quick, from many people's perspective, ending to something that could have drug on for much longer. Also, the way that the Rwandan Patriotic Front has behaved after the genocide in terms of building unity and reconciliation and bringing people who were part of the old government into the new government. And, and this idea of um, that you don't have to, young people don't have to be defined by the choices of their parents, even if their parents committed genocide, they, they are working for them to, the young people, to be incorporated into this new idea of a new Rwandan identity. So we could go on a lot longer about that, but I also have to say, the Rwandan Patriotic Front was fighting for their families. They weren't just fighting for the people who are outside the country. Many of them had family members, cousins, aunts, uncles, grandparents, families living in, nieces and nephew in Rwanda, and those family members are being killed. And I really find it I, I really find it offensive that people would put forth the idea that they just would hold back and watch their families be killed. That's just, 
I don't, I don't buy that at all for some political purposes. Uh, so you, you mentioned here too, part B, about I was able to work with my Rwandan colleagues to help, help families during the genocide, humanitarian work. Do I think that I could have been possible to do, make a difference on a national level, perhaps political action? I honestly don't. I have thought about that a lot. You know, you get the luxury of thinking about it afterwards. When you're in the middle of the genocide, I didn't think about it. We were just working to survive day to day and make a difference for as many people as we could make a difference for. However, looking back at it, the only way I was able to make a difference as a humanitarian was to have a relationship with the people who are in power. So if I was on one hand political lobbying against the people in power, I would have never been able to have enough of a working relationship with them to help the people who were struggling. So those two things would have been, uh, I think, in really conflict and I, I wouldn't have been able to, to work with my Rwandan colleagues to help people on a humanitarian level. Your last one, the UN's mission in Rwanda. Glad you brought that up too. Uh, the UN, I think about the UN as people on the ground and people back in New York at headquarters. And unfortunately, I'm afraid there's often a massive disconnect between the two and Rwanda illustrates that really powerfully. General Dallaire on the ground was not getting the kind of support or response from New York that he really dis um, deserved. They saw that even before the plane was shot down and the genocide started, that, that this storm was building, that weapons were being brought in, and they wanted to take decisive action to nip it in the bud, and New York would not support them. And then when the genocide started, New York, um, the planners of the genocide, you, you mentioned in here um, about the UN, you said they cooperated with the genocidal government. I wouldn't say they cooperated um, and refused to help any local people escape. No, they did. Okay, here's the best I can explain to you. They, they had weak and not um, well-formed policies and strategies that the planners of the genocide took advantage of. This happened just a few months, six months or so after the story in this movie Black Hawk Down in Somalia where American rangers uh, on an operation were, uh, that went bad were killed. Some of their bodies horribly drugged through the streets of Mogadishu and America led the exodus out of Somalia. The planners of the genocide killed 10 Belgian UN soldiers. I think in direct, um, they took their cue from Somalia and, and they said, if we can kill these um, soldiers, we'll get rid of the UN and we'll get rid of the foreigners. And it worked really well for them, although not completely, because General Dallaire and his assistant, Henry Adiaho, they, they um, maintain that we cannot abandon these people. And they finally managed to get the UN to allow them to stay with a small force of who volunteered among the UN soldiers already there of about, I think, 270 soldiers, and they saved the lives of thousands. And they make a very strong case for how if all 2,500 would have stayed and been supported by the UN, the genocide could have been stopped. So yes, the UN had poor policies, and then they made terrible choices that the planners of the genocide exploited came to a place where UN soldiers were, and when the UN fled, they killed all 3,000 people there at uh, Don Bosco Technical School. So they really exploited uh, the poor choices and policies of the UN in this, in this situation. Uh, do I think that it could have, uh, they could, the UN could have done something more to prevent or stop? Absolutely. The, General Dallaire, had they listened to his strategy, I think that they could have uh, stopped it before it even started, or at least if they would have listened to him when it started, he wanted to set up safe havens in soccer, football stadiums around the country. He had strategies that could have saved thousands and perhaps stopped the genocide early on. So, very, very good questions. Um, glad to visit with you students. I look forward to the next time we get to have these conversations. Take care.